Welcome to Friendly Words, the sermon podcast of Pratt Friends Church in Pratt, Kansas. The message you're about to hear was originally preached at Pratt Friends Church on Sunday, February 21st, 2021. Its focus is faith in God in every area of life. The message to all who will listen is God can be trusted with our health issues, big and small, the fears which threaten to undo us, and every demonic attack which comes our way. Now here is Pastor Mike Neifert. God, thank you for your love for us, and God, we thank you that you have given us your written word, and more than that, that you've given us your spoken word through the Spirit, and I pray, God, that today you would change our hearts, that we'd hear directly from you. In Jesus' name, amen. This past Wednesday marked the beginning of the season of Lent. It's a time of year when many Christians around the world remember Christ's sacrifice by giving up something that they hold near and dear. Some give up chocolate. Others abstain from alcohol. A few cut spending or shopping to a bare minimum. And in today's world, many fast from social media for those 40 days. The aim of Lent is not weight loss for weight loss' sake or disconnection for disconnection's sake. The point is to deny yourself so that you can focus on God's goodness and meditate on what Jesus did on the cross for us. To give thanks to the Spirit for the help that he gives us every day in overcoming sin. I'm thankful for that, aren't you? When you crave what you've given up, that longing is an invitation to spend time in prayer, to pause and give thanks, to bow low in worship, to get out and go and do something good in Christ's name. Imagine how much time you would have for praying and doing good if you stopped surfing YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and everything else that distracts you. I don't know if any of you are observing this season of self-denial, and I don't need to know what you decide to do or not do in this case between you and the Lord. This is kind of some of that be careful not to do your good deeds before men kind of stuff that we talked about a couple of weeks ago in chapter 6. What we learned then applies now. Do the good that God shows you to do for his glory and for him alone. Not to get a pat on the back and say, way to go, just to do what God's called you to do. So this morning's message is not about Lent. I just wanted to talk briefly about Lent to help you to understand the purpose of that season of self-denial. I wanted you to know how sacrificing little things can lead to more time with God. Something that we could all use more of, right? Time with your Father in heaven builds your confidence in him, increases your trust in his goodness. So before we open to this week's chapter of Matthew, which is chapter 8, let's take a moment to talk about faith in more general terms. We're going to start with a quick discussion of faith's meaning. Thankfully, the writer of Hebrews helps us out here. God gives us a definition right in his word. At the beginning of chapter 11, which we have often called the chapter of faith or the faith chapter or the hall of fame of faith, We've called it lots of things, but here's the definition that we're given in God's word. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Are you sure God can do what he says his word says he can do? That's faith. Do you trust God to do what's best for you, even if it doesn't make sense to you? That's faith too. Faith is believing and trusting in God. The object of our faith is God, right? We know that he's good, and so we wait on his timing. We listen for his direction. We obey, as I said earlier, even when it doesn't make sense. In God we trust is our national motto. Now, I would argue that uh, no time in my lifetime have we much followed that, but it is a good definition or a good description of what faith is. Faith is trust in God. He is our object of faith. If our faith is in any other, it's worthless. Unquestioningly trusting in anything, money, power, fame, talents, abilities, or anyone, politicians, doctors, preachers, spouses, celebrities, for all we need in life, if we trust in anyone else for all we need in life, we're headed in the wrong direction. That's misplaced faith. Does that mean that we shouldn't trust anyone? Of course not. 
but we shouldn't look to any human for what God alone can provide. Only God can fulfill all of our needs and give us fail-safe plans, expecting anyone other than him to do either of these things is foolishness. Spouses, parents, friends cannot give us all that we need. God sometimes gives us what we need through them, but it's God that we look to first. Faith, then, reduced to its simplest form, is trust. It's trust in God, reliance on him, knowing that he's working his best out for us and in us and through us. Faith is asking God for what we need and asking him to meet the needs of others, asking him to show himself to other people so that they can put their faith in him as well. Are you confident in what you hope for? That's faith. Are you sure of what you do not yet see? That's faith as well. So now we're ready for Matthew chapter 8. We can open up to chapter 8 and see what this faith that we've been defining looks like. We'll see a number of people act in faith in this chapter. And we're going to watch as Jesus interacts with them and see what he does in response to their faith in him, whether it's great faith or little faith. The very first story of this chapter, full of stories, is one found in the first four verses. It tells us about a diseased man's encounter with our Lord. And so let's find what we can find in chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. Matthew 8, 1 through 4 starts with this. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing. He said, be clean. Immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Do you hear the confidence in this man's statement? He didn't use many words, but every word that he chose conveyed great trust in God's power to make what was wrong with his body right. If you are willing... The leper does not demand God act as he wants to. He humbly recognizes God's sovereignty, acknowledging perfect health may not be what he needs most. He trusts God to do what is best while making it clear what he wants. You can make me clean. That's what he wants, right? This man suffering greatly from what is probably an incurable disease knows that he knows that he knows that Jesus has the power to make his skin normal again. He believes it's possible for God to do what he asks, even though he can't see the answer just yet. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Is that your attitude every time that you come to God with a request for healing? Whether asking for yourself or for another, do you acknowledge God can heal while trusting it is still his best for you or your friend if he says no or not yet? Faith. It's confidently asking God to do what you believe is best while trusting God to do what is actually best. Can we admit it is difficult to understand sometimes why God doesn't do what we want him to do or what we pray fervently about? I bet you don't get it sometimes. God, why didn't you heal that person? When we're puzzled, we would do well to honor God, speaking or singing out our trust in him. He is all wise and we are not, as was true when we talked about judging. We don't know enough to decide perfectly. We don't know enough to judge perfectly. We don't know how to decide perfectly to to will what is best. And so we leave what is best to God's mind. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. God can heal. We know it's true. He will heal when it is best, and we can trust this is true. All right, let's read another section from Matthew 8. The next story of faith begins in verse 5. This one features a man crying out for help to God for someone that he cares deeply about. Listen to Matthew 8, 5 to 13. That's Matthew 8, 5 to 13. Hear what Jesus says about faith as he interacts with a man of authority in his time. Starting verse 5, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? 
The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Here's a man who's not a part of the Jewish nation. A man who likely didn't worship the one true God. Still, in this moment, he puts his trust in Jesus, doesn't he? He believes Jesus is able to heal his servant whether he comes with him to the house or not. And believing, he asks for what he wants, just like the leper did. When Jesus assures the centurion that it's done, the man walks away knowing that it's done. Did you catch what Jesus said about this man's faith? He said it was greater than any that he'd seen from anybody in Israel. What did Hebrews 1.1 tell us that faith was? It's confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This story illustrates both parts, doesn't it? This man was confident that what he hoped for had been taken place when Jesus said it was done, and he trusted even before he saw the results even before he went home and found his servant well. Do you want to have faith like this man's? Yeah, me too. Every Sunday morning, we pray for people who are not present with us, maybe because they're ill or because they're at a distance. Friends who are or are not part of our local fellowship, we ask God's best for them, knowing that he is not limited in the least by their proximity to us. He being present with us and with them is more than able to act on our pleas for their needs. Sometimes we hear what God's done in response to our faith-filled petitions. Sometimes we hear nothing. Still we pray, trusting God to intervene and to do his best. Does your faith need to grow? Mine does. God grant us greater faith. Amen? One more story about physical healing before we move on to another focus. The part of the narrative that I want us to drill down on now is in verses 14 to 17. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to wait on them. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. I include this short episode for one simple reason. I want you to see God's care for the things that we think are little. If it weren't for our current concerns over COVID, we wouldn't think that much about a fever, would we? We'd take a couple Tylenol and rest, and many times we wouldn't even pray about what's going on at all. It's just a fever, a little thing. Perhaps our faith needs to grow. I'm not saying you shouldn't take meds. I'm simply asking you to entrust all your health woes, even the seemingly little concerns to God. You don't have to be in a tizzy about something to take it to your Father in heaven. Our faith relationship with God ought to be close enough, intimate enough, that we can share anything with him, take anything to him. There's no big or small concern in God's kingdom. Take them all to him and let him sort out what's going to be taken care of and how. This past week, I got my second COVID shot. First time, I got kind of sick with it. Wednesday night, before I got my shot, at prayer meeting, I just asked that we pray about it. And the person who prayed out loud said, God, I pray that there would be no symptoms. Okay, so I get my shot. Nothing on Thursday after I got my shot. Wake up Friday, which is when I threw up before. Sorry for the details. No symptoms. No symptoms Saturday. No symptoms today. Just want to give God glory for that. Little things, big things, 
It's God, okay? We put our faith in him because he's able. All right, so we've talked enough about faith for physical healing. So let's move on. Health isn't the only thing that we bring to God in faith. We need to learn to trust him in every area of life. Matthew 8, 23 to 27 introduces us to another area where faith is needed. Here's what it says. Matthew 8, 23 to 27. Then he, that is Jesus, got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Jesus' disciples faced this storm in the story in the same way that most of us would, screaming bloody murder. Ah! Jesus sleeps. His friends have to wake him up to tell him how bad it is. Does he join them in panic mode as he rubs his eyes and stretches? Nope. He looks at them and says these amazing words, you of little faith, why are you afraid? Now, there's two things I want you to notice here. First, Jesus doesn't say they have no faith. He says they're of little faith. Second, Jesus implies that fear is not the reaction he expects for those who have faith in him. Trust is the assumed response. I guess we can cut these guys a little slack. After all, they'd never seen Jesus calm a storm before, as far as we know. They'd never experienced that. So how could they know what he'd do if they'd never experienced what he could do? Even so, they do call on him. They do cry out to him to save them. This shows a bit of faith, doesn't it? Jesus, ignoring their fearful, we're going to drown, acknowledges that it is faith that caused them to cry out. He recognizes their faith and their fear. Lord, save us. There's faith in that statement, even if the heart of the person shouting it is anything but settled. Even when spoken in fear, its aim is to move the Lord's heart. The crier knows God is the only hope that they have. He yells above the storm, trusting God to hear his plea and act on his behalf. Lord, save us. We're going to drown. There doesn't seem to be even a tiny bit of faith in those words. Just fear. Still, they aren't just shouted into the thin air, are they? They're shouted or spoken to Jesus. A few months back, I listened to Tim Keller's sermon series on prayer. He taught his congregation to pray in all circumstances. His messages encourage believers to pray their doubts, to pray their tears, to pray their guilt, to pray their fears. His point was that we should talk to God about each of these things, even as we're experiencing them. Do you have fears? I guess you do. Talk to God about them. Addressing him in the middle of life's terror-inducing storm shows faith, at least a little bit of faith. There's a difference between shouting, ah, and ah, God, isn't there? Jesus often calms the storm as he did in the story, and doesn't watching him do so here and in the lives of others cause your faith to grow stronger? Aren't you less fearful and more trusting the next time the thunder claps and the lightning strikes? Fear is replaced with faith when we know that God can calm the storms. God can handle your health issues. We can trust him with each and every ailment, whether it's his will to heal completely or not. God can calm our fears. We can trust him to see us through every threatening situation in life, natural disasters, persecution, near accidents, record low temperatures. He's with us and he can save. There's one more section to read in Matthew chapter 8. In the final verses, we see Jesus take on dark spiritual powers. How he handles demons ought to cause faith to grow when we're under attack by our enemy, the devil. Listen to Matthew 8, 28 to 34. 
When Jesus arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. And they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed man. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave the region. First things first, you must have noticed that Jesus was in charge. Throughout the entire account, He's the boss. He's in a position of power. The demons address him as the son of God. They cower and beg before him. They do only what he allows or what he commands. Let's be clear about something. God is greater than the devil. They are not equals, not at all. John, in his first letter to the church, addresses believers who are facing persecution. In the first verses of 1 John chapter 4, John speaks of those who oppose Christ, calling the spirit within them the Antichrist. And then he says this in verse 4. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The one that's in you is greater than the one in the world. Who's the one in the world? It's the enemy, right? The devil. The one who's in you, that's the spirit of God if you're a believer. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The devil is powerful, yes, but not all powerful. Compared to God, the devil is puny. So, if the spirit of God is in you and you come under enemy fire, who's going to win? It's not Satan. Satan. He cannot do anything against God. When God commands, he obeys. God is the one who is the ultimate authority in the spiritual realm, in all realms. So when you're in the middle of a spiritual battle, where you're trying to resist sin or where you're feeling oppressed or whatever's going on, you're only vulnerable if you're not depending upon God. If God is with you, you will win. So this past week, I spent every spare moment reading Donnie Stewart's new book, Juggernaut, One Fireman's Battle-Proven Strategy to Prevail Against Sin. Donnie invites believers to invite God to go with them into every spiritual battle. Listen to what he wrote in chapter 4. Jesus never asks anything of us that he does not intend to assist us in accomplishing. We hear the directive or command, decide to obey, and as we set out, he supernaturally assists and works in and through us to achieve the very thing he asks of us. How freeing is that? He accomplishes through me the very obedience he asks of me. We literally can't lose. We can overcome the enemy's temptations because when we resist Satan and the power of the Spirit, we win. God wins. God will be with us. He will help us. If the devil attacks... Pigs are going to fly. You and I need to remember the power imbalance when praying for our friends and our family. When you go to God asking for the salvation of an unbelieving or unrepentant person, know that you are calling upon the Almighty to wade into the fray against a much weaker foe. Pray in faith and watch God work. Friends, the one you love and serve Jesus, he has the power to heal. He has the power to protect, the power to rescue. Take every illness to him. Take every fear to him. Take every demonic attack to him. Are you dealing with any of those things? Do you know someone who needs prayer for any of these things? I urge you to talk to God about whatever's troubling you, whatever trouble you're enduring, whatever ills have befallen someone you love. Talk with God. Mention every need, trusting him to do what's perfect. Remember, we talked about praying our fears. Ah, God is better than ah. We pray, Lord, if you're willing, you can do all things. That's a prayer of faith. So let me give you just a moment to commune with God, to listen to him, to bring your request to him. Whatever it is that you have, you pray and bring those things to him.
God, we confess that there are a lot of things in life that we have less control over than we'd like to have control over. And we know that you are more than powerful to do what we need you to do, and we trust that you would do what's best for us. Father, as we've prayed, as we brought our request to you, we ask that you would do your perfect will. Lord, if you're willing, you can, and so we trust you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me close with just a brief word of encouragement from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. This is 1 Corinthians 16, 13 to 14. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. Anyone whose faith is in God can live these things out. Trust God and obey him this week, knowing that he goes with you into every day. God help us all, right? Amen. We hope you have been encouraged and challenged by today's sermon. If you want to hear each week's message, be sure to subscribe to Friendly Words in your podcast app. May God bless you as you follow Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit.